Hi folks, this is Jacob Grace, and you're listening to Perennial AF, the Savannah Institute's podcast and blog about perennial agroforestry. We'll be listening back to the live Q&A with Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, one of our keynote speakers. Dr. Kimmerer is a mother, professor, and enrolled member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation. Her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, has earned her worldwide acclaim, along with her previous book, Gathering Moss. Dr. Kimmerer is also the founder and director of the State University of New York's Center for Native Peoples and the Environment, whose mission is to create programs which draw on the wisdom of both indigenous and scientific knowledge for our shared goals of sustainability. She is interested in the restoration of not just ecological communities, but restoration of our relationships to the land. In a pre-recorded presentation at the PFG, Dr. Kimmerer described her vision for uniting the best of SEK, or scientific ecological knowledge, with the best of TEK, or traditional ecological knowledge. Not by blending or hybridizing them, but by letting them each stand on their own and grow to their full potential in the same garden, a garden of knowledge. Here is Savannah Institute Executive Director Keith Keeley introducing Kurt Miney, a friend and colleague of both the Savannah Institute and Dr. Kimmerer, who moderated the question and answer session. So um, Robin, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I want to extend gratitude on behalf of our whole community for, for you joining us and, and for all of your work, really appreciate it. And Kurt, thank you for um, helping to welcome Robin and, and hold this conversation today as well. Thank you, Keith. Well, this is not work. This is a delight and an honor and um, uh, a chance to reconnect with a dear old friend. Um, and so, uh, uh, Robin, on, if I may say Robin, <laughs> Robin and I go way, we go way back. So it seems we can't be very formal, but for your work, for your message today and all your messages and for your willingness to be with us today, thank you for these gifts to us uh, here in the, mostly in the Midwest, but this is an audience that stretches far and wide. So um, we're just so grateful and thank you again for taking time out of your busy uh, schedule to join us from your place. And um, I should say that uh, I am speaking from Sauk County, just up the road from the North Farm of the Savannah Institute in what my Ho-Chunk friends and neighbors call Ma Wakan Chunk, uh, which is the sacred earth. So um, th welcome, Robin. Thank you, and thank you again for sharing your message. Miigwech for this this warm welcome. I'm I'm so glad to be with you. It's a it's a delight for me as well, both to, to be in conversation with an old friend, and for all of you who we are we are you know on on team land here, right? And I'm I'm really interested in hearing about the work that you all are doing uh, to learn from you and, and to share some uh, ideas. So thank you so much for inviting me here. Well, let's get right to it. I know we have not enough time and there are a lot of questions. I'm seeing them pour in and I'm going to do my very best to get as many in and to, uh, to help our audience to, uh, to gain from your experience and thoughts. And I did want to ask a couple questions real quickly to um, sort of, I think, anticipate some of what we might hear from our participants. But mm -hmm. um, Robin, um, in your talk, there were several hints that you were aiming your presentation first toward educators. And I think we're all educators, especially when we're trying to make changes in large systems. Um, but a lot of the folks on this call and, and this program are either in nonprofits or they are land caretakers in their own places and landscapes. So just any quick thoughts about how your message you shared for those who are educators translates outside the walls of academe into, into places. Uh, so those working in the nonprofit sector are working on their own lands. How does the intellectual polyculture get put into practice by those of us outside of academia. Mm. Well, and that's really where it happens, right? Is is with people's hands 
in the earth, um, really making these ideas real in the world. And you're quite right. That talk was designed for for, for uh, educators. But the message, I think, one of the important messages about that intellectual polyculture is the right relationship between indigenous knowledge and, and Western science, those tools which are, are both present and that, that, that many of us carry as well. And what seems important to me that translates pretty clearly into practice is to is to put at the central focus on indigenous philosophy because that is held up as like the intellectual scaffolding right that supports that curious being of 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 western science and i think in land care and in innovative land care in particularly you know, when I think when I heard myself say innovative land care, so much of this is a reflection of ancestral land care. So it is it is simultaneously new and ancient um, at, at, at the same time. So that remembering element um, is really important in centering those values of respect and reciprocity and responsibility, accountability, kinship with 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 the land and and using those as as the real guides to the work on the land um is i think an important guide that 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 can uh, shape all the work that that we do and then we remember that those scientific um perspectives are tools they're tools that help us um implement those those values on the land and that actually leads right into the to the next question, which I see reflected in some of the comments coming in from our participants. And that is uh, just to, if you want to share a few initial thoughts about perennial plants. Um, uh, we all, you know, we so appreciate the three sisters story, and it's amazing to watch how that basic message of polyculture, the value of diversity and reciprocity in our agricultural systems has opened so many people to a new way of understanding, an old way of understanding. Mm -hmm. But how about perennial plants? How about perennial trees and shrubs, other woody plants, perennial ground covers and food plants, and indigenous agroforestry traditions? If Again, we always have to watch our language that we're conflating things. But how about the role of perennials in indigenous food systems? Yeah, well, I can really, only speak with with any um, deep familiarity from Nishnabe perspectives, and I also live here in Haudenosaunee territory in upstate New York, where I've learned a lot about food forests from from my neighbors, uh, the Onondaga, and this, you know, the what I'm always trying to remind myself is that. A biodiverse landscape is also a food secure landscape, right? That is how our people, you know, provisioned themselves well and provided for more than human relatives at the same time by creating this biodiverse successional mosaic that relied primarily on perennial plants. Um, the food forest, uh, especially things like nut crops um, that were so intentionally tended, not only with, with cultural burning, but with assisted migration. Um, I think about uh, how many times I've been told by plant knowledge holders about the movement of, of, of plants that in so much so that some plants came to rely on us to move them certainly as effectively as, uh, as, as the squirrels. Um, things like butternuts, butternuts and black walnuts in my part of the world here are oftentimes botanists will look at them and say, well, what are those Southern plants doing here in Northern New York? We like them. <laughs> and, so, and so they were often moved, often moved and tended to create these you know, highly vertically stratified and temporally stratified food forests of, you know, from uh, big hazelnut in the shrub layer to to um, the nut trees, um, both the ones that people moved here and the native nut trees like beeches and, and, and oaks uh, as, as well. So, um, yeah, uh, the, the idea of, of a provisioning landscape which is is primarily 
rooted, if you will, in in, in tree crops and perennials um, is absolutely a part. But remembering also that it's a successional mosaic. So there were annual plants. Uh, take Minoan, right? Um, that that um, were part of that successional mosaic as well. But the, the dominant um, uh, landscape being perennial food mm. bearers. Wonderful. Um, I hope, uh, again, I'm going to be trying to uh, synthesize a lot of amazingly interesting thoughts and questions from our viewers here. So Zinwan and Samantha, I hope I was able to uh, cover a little bit of that, uh, in, of your questions, uh, because they've also asked about, you know, lessons we can learn from long-lived things, moss and hickory, sugar, maples. Um, so Zinwan, I'm hoping pronouncing your name correctly, but um, this is somewhat related. When we talk about indigenous or, or ancient practices that we may now call agroforestry, um, how are we going to try to find our way forward in respectfully learning from the ancient and tried systems, yet using these new Western tools? and even more importantly, perhaps the goal. So I'll take Jin Wan's a statement here. Sometimes it seems we talk about agroforestry from solely a Western agricultural perspective where the focus is on maximizing yield. Uh, and even if those yields aren't commodity crops in, and we talk about inputs and profits and such, how do we bring more, how can we bring a more traditional ecological mindset into conversations about agroforestry for net, the present and the future. I love that question and that reflection um, because what you're really pointing out so well is that, and that's why these indigenous principles, the corn needs to be the center of the work, right? Because the values are not cash crop. The values are not productivity, short-term productivity. The values are longevity, right? And being able to, and resilience, being able to ride those waves of scarcity and plenty that, well, dang, the nut trees just teach us that, don't they? You know, mast fruiters. Um, they, they teach us that we have to be, that they all have to be present because some are going to be abundant in one year and, and others another. So it's really stability, resilience, and longevity, not only of the ecosystem, but longevity of the relationship to the ecosystem. Um, that seems to me to be the corn, the intellectual scaffolding that that underpins um, this kind of permaculture um, is is valuing something other than short term gain. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. If I'm looking off the screen, it's because I have questions on my, uh, on another screen next to me. So I don't mean Ooh. to be rude. You are uh, juggling. Good luck. I, I am. I am just. If it weren't be wouldn't be so hard if the the things I'm juggling weren't so fascinating and interesting, and I want to yeah. think about them myself. <laughs> but um, you know, I'll take a simple question or basic question while I formulate a little more complex one. But uh, one of the questions came up about some other up and coming indigenous writers particularly perhaps on the themes of agriculture and, and perennial agroecosystems. Are there others in, in your in your awareness, Robin, that we should be thinking and looking to uh, other writers that you can recommend or other folks in your circles? Yeah, other writers and, and thinkers, particularly in the in the realm of, of, of food systems. I am so taken with the writing of Rowan White. Um, you know, an, an important matriarch in in seed keeping, and and um, and revitalization of of traditional agricultural methods, and the way that she writes about the respectful relationship to our ancestral plants as 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 teachers, as keepers of memory. Um, I always learn something, and am deeply moved by her writing at the same time. Mm. And I might try to go back and forth from a, a maybe a little more scientific technical question to a little more uh, open open and, and uh, uh, broad question, but here's a little more kind of hands-on question for you from one of our uh, folks here with us. And that's, she, she asked the question, how about how we should consider pesticides as a tool? 
and something that should never be used, or is there a, ever a place for it? I'll, I'll broaden that or re, more, make it more broad to ask about modern, quote, scientific technologies in agriculture. Uh, that's a huge question, obviously, but um, how do we think, and whether you're doing restoration work or you're involved in, uh, in I won't say production agriculture, but forms of agroecology, um, how do we think about the proper way of addressing these new technological tools you know, that we're given? You know, I, I, I will admit that I feel ill-equipped to answer that question, um, but some reflections on it, I, I, I guess I could offer that are probably the same reflections that many of you are, are wrestling with. And that is, you know, I think, in the short term, sometimes those tools are pretty tempting in the way that they can help us. I think of it in restoration ecology, that they can help create a clean slate, right? That, that you can work from. But I, I also really tend to be guided by, well, what are the natural equivalents here? What could we do instead that might have a similar, um, setting back of succession um, uh, and 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 try to try to engage with those solutions first to to use the the wisdom of the land and and, and time in solving these problems but what that really requires of course is longer term thinking um, and sometimes our projects are constrained aren't they by by time and our accountability to funders, to grantors, et cetera, um, puts pressure on shorter term solutions. Um, so I don't have an answer, um, save to say that my, my inclination would be to try the um, natural solutions first. And uh, if, if nothing else works, then to consider those options. Mm. Maybe this is a, a, a version of the same question in some ways, but um, uh, this is from Vanessa. Um, and I think she speaks for a lot of folks because there's so many practitioners, people with their hands on the land every day, uh, working hard to do good. Um, but she asks as non-Indigenous landowners uh, who are seeking, you know, how to, how we may follow up on the message you shared and that is to combine and find the garden the 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 symbiosis of tek and sek um when i'll ask the, i'll let her ask the question when in the process of establishing these relationships if we want to start uh drawing on tek are there ways to do it in a way that is not appropriating tek especially if you don't have access to uh, people, knowledge, tradition, language, the other aspects of all that you've shared with the world, Robin. But what? how does a non-Indigenous landowner and practitioner go about trying to do this in the right way and with right relationship? Mm -hmm. I thank you for that really respectful and thoughtful question. It's, 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 it's really important. And, and especially the recognition that oftentimes, you know, one of the responses is, well, we, we need to connect with our local native communities and seek guidance. And we do we seek guidance of, of the original caretakers of, of those places. But in my own experience, our, our, our indigenous communities are stretched pretty thin, taking care of their own lands, their own concerns and and it can become a burden quite honestly to be constantly educating and doing this outreach uh, work and so one of the things that i really try to counsel people is something that you already know and that is to learn from the land because where did traditional ecological knowledge come from um, it is set in a cultural framework that regards the land as teacher and it's a kind of biomimicry in a way um, that comes from very close attention to the land and experimentation 
on on the land and observing those results. And so I think that is the way that you engage with this kind of land-based knowledge without appropriation is to create the authentic relationship to land yourself um, so that you're learning from the land. <coughs> I find that particularly important in um, the context of the resurgence and revitalization of traditional ecological knowledge, which again was taught us in symbiosis with our more than human relatives. But you know, nature is a moving target, right? Um, those relationships are always changing and they're changing really quickly right now in the time of, of accelerating uh, climate change. And so learning how to learn from the land seems to me to have primacy because yeah. we, we have to learn new things in, in this time informed by traditional values and traditional ways of knowing. But the most authentic relationship that you can have with land is one of being a, a humble student. Mm -hmm. You're listening to the live Q&A session from last week's Perennial Farm Gathering with author and ecologist, Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. If you registered for this year's PFG, you'll have free access to the recordings from all of the sessions, including this Q&A session. I'm not actually sure if those recordings have been posted yet, but if not, they will be very soon. So you'll have lots of agroforestry content to help get you through the long, cold nights this time of year. This podcast is made possible by the Grassland 2.0 Project, which is working to transform Midwest agriculture to perennial agroecosystems. Grassland 2.0 has released a couple of new, free, Excel-based planning tools, the Heifer Grazing Compass and the Beef Grazing Compass, to help livestock producers predict and understand cash flow and long-term financial outcomes associated with transitioning to a grass-based system. You can learn more and download the compasses at grasslandag.org slash tools. Perennial AF is also sponsored by Canopy, a perennial farm management business and tree crop nursery based in Illinois and Wisconsin. Launched in 2022 by the Savannah Institute and Grantham Environmental Trust, Canopy is helping scale up agroforestry in the Midwest by providing plant material and farm management services. You can learn more about what products and services are available in your area at canopyfm.com. And now let's get back to Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, answering questions collected from the audience by Kurt Miney, a Leopold scholar and friend and neighbor of the Savannah Institute. I'm gonna now kind of toggle back and ask a, a little more open-ended question. Um, it comes from Donna and um, Robin, you've written and shared so much about what it is to not only be an inheritor of an, as you put it in your talk, an endangered language, um, but for all of us to pay attention to our language. And yet, how about other ways of communicating, especially in, in this work? And what she has in mind is art and music and dance. And why I love this question is because this group, the Savannah Institute, I loved the talks this morning. More than a few of them talked about how we integrate the arts and poetry and other ways of communicating into the practice and the research even that we do. So how about a few thoughts of your own um, on what, what Donna here calls almost prelingual uh, ways of communicating and that have special potential maybe for advancing that kind of uh, reciprocity um, that that you have uh, so eloquently talked about, right? And I, it it feels um, perhaps a, a little caring calls to Newcastle to say to a preeminent <laughs> Leopold scholar, <laughs> um, oh, I you know one of my favorite um, uh, reflections from Aldo Leopold is that notion that we need foresters who are poets. Um, that this this false um, uh, separation between the arts and 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 science is uh, is cutting us off from ourselves and is cutting us off from our 
authentic experience um, on the land. And so pre-lingual, yes, perhaps. Um, I don't know about the the temporal uh, sequence there, but feeling relationship to land and communicating in that those really important emotive states is what creates relationship with place that helps create longevity, right? That these are not just passing ideas, these are deeply embodied relationships to, to place. Um, you know, I think about the times that I've been on the land and a, and a community member will show me in the woods a dance circle. You know, a place where the forest, you do, would just think it's an ordinary forest until you feel under the leaf litter that there is the circle where people have danced their devotion to to all the values we've talked about uh, since time immemorial. And that really speaks of such a deep relationship to place that is, is what I, I think is the medicine for a very transient, hyper-individual society because as we know in the the arts have that potential to create collective intention mm -hmm. um, and, you know i'm also thinking about bill mckibben's comments about um what we need in the in in this in this movement is is um art artists engagement as well you know his quote is something well where's the opera where is the mm. climate change opera that will have people on their knees and and change them in a way that the facts clearly do not mm. yeah and again let me say a thank you to all the presenters this morning and i'm sure coming up in the next two days here who have reflected that in their presentations i've really really grooved on that, listening to farmers talking about how they're incorporating the arts and performance and ceremony into their work, um, wherever they're, they are. Okay, we'll toggle back now to a little more uh, uh, specific question. This is a fascinating one, Robin, and I've been thinking about it myself a lot. And the question comes from someone who uses chestnuts as their kind of starting point uh, about how now we're seeing chestnuts being planted in larger scale monocultures mm. for corporate, you know, corporations going into this. And there may be, if we look forward, we may look at larger unsustainable chestnut farms as an alternative to large unsustainable corn and soybean, something like that. So this is a fascinating and difficult question. How do we look to alternatives and yet learn the lessons that have come from reductionism, commodification, the capitalistic overtaking of even the alternatives. Um, so how can not just the Savannah Institute perhaps, but all of us begin to think about diversifying our systems and our landscapes using the kind of knowledge you shared with us, uh, Robin, so that we can not only achieve the 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 economic goals, but also the social and environmental and cultural goals that we also are striving for and looking for alternatives. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a powerful image. Um, and I just saw the comment of somebody said, you know, the idea of a monoculture of chestnuts making you want to cry. Yeah, mm -hmm. me too. And, and again, I want to return to this, to your first question, Kurt, about um, the way that three sisters knowledge garden metaphor can be employed here. Because if we think about guiding perennial agriculture with those principles, the idea of a chestnut monoculture is so incompatible with those ideas of, of, of respect and, and reciprocity that we have to start there. Because why, do, why a monoculture? Because short-term productivity is is held up as as the value um to me those kinds of of, of monocultures especially of long-term of long-lived beings is a kind of enslavement of those beings right you know to our purposes um uh, and and to heck with their purposes and their relationships in the world so um 
I think that the pushback is a philosophical one. It is to say that that's that enhanced productivity of chestnuts is not the question. Mm -hmm. If the question is how can forests sequester carbon, create biodiversity, and create um, provisions for humans and and more than humans, that's the question we should be asking, mm -hmm. not. Not how can we increase our our yield per acre during this fiscal year? Mm, thank you for that, uh, boy. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna do a little geographic uh, jump here. Um, we have a number of participants I've noticed from the Pacific Northwest, and um, some. So I I love this question, and I, I admit that it's one I'm choosing because I know Robin uh, shares my passion here. Uh, so. Um, from, uh, I'm not sure the first name, but highlighting the importance of the white pine planted as part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. How, here's the question. How can we look to trees we plant now as keepers of promises, records of knowledge, and symbols of hope? So whether it's white pine in, in your place or of cedars in the Northwest or of... Uh, uh, oak savannas here in the Midwest, looking to trees as keepers of promises, records of knowledge, and so wonderful phrase in that question. All of the above. That's such a beautiful question. And the answer is the question, right? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful framing of the meaning of trees in our landscape, isn't it? Um, and it it puts me in mind of I was giving a talk not long ago in a in a college audience and a, a, a young young man stood up and he said, I'm going to ask you a really personal question. I thought, oh, what's this going to be? And and he said, after all of your your work in this field, he says, does it bother you that you will not see the results of, of all of your work? And that question just made me giggle because like, well, in a tree world, you know, you taking the long view, this is a long game, right? Um, the plants, the trees in particular are keepers of story, keepers of memory, and that beautiful phrase of planting shade trees we will not sit under mm. that's the teachings of trees right um is is to take that 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 long view that they will take care of things um long after we're gone if we take care of them mm. and now let's go to the southwest um and i see the question in the chat but i also have it on my other screen here from alicia if i have your name correct um as a navajo farmer Serious, I'm curious about challenges you see in your communities in practicing TEK in terms of accessing land and resources. And this is what I know is an issue for my Ho-Chunk neighbors here in Sauk County. It's an issue I'm sure everywhere, um, but um, coming from, uh, from Diné land in the Southwest, accessing land and resources if you are a indigenous farmer looking to make these kind of uh, changes in your own practices. Absolutely. Um, and it's always about the land, isn't it? It's always about our responsibilities, our access to our own homelands, and that, that feeling of both injustice and heartbreak when the thing, our responsibilities for the land can't be enacted or so difficult to enact because we don't have access to our very own homelands. And so this really broadens the work that we're doing into the area of land justice, doesn't it? Of how do we extend land access to original caretakers? To me, that's the essence of, of restoration. You have to restore the caretakers, um, ca caretakers access to land at, at the same time. So I'm very much um, enamored of, of the, the land justice movement for increased access, land tenure, land back, all of those important movements that that um, put people and, and indigenous peoples and our homelands back in in right relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that 
this wonderful community that you've assembled here can really be part of, of that, that pressure of how do we create land justice through land sharing, through land trust. I think about um, the emerging uh, indigenous land trust movement. Um, uh, I think about the model of the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust. Maybe there's one in the Southwest as, as, as well. Um, yeah, and it's kind of somewhat related, I guess, if we think of it this way. We were just talking about land and access to land and Western concepts of property and how that inhibits so much of what we hope to achieve. But how about intellectual property? I know this is, can be kind of an obscure topic for a lot of folks, but in your work, Robin, especially with those working on food sovereignty issues, and again, respectfully pursuing these kind of goals together. The question of intellectual property, and it comes up in a question in the chat that you all can look at here at greater length, but um, about what, what we can do to ensure intellectual property rights are respected, honored. Uh, you know, how do we re, how do we navigate trying to incorporate more indigenous knowledge and materials while also respecting and fairly uh, working with that knowledge and those materials. Oh, Have absolutely. You... Well, what, this is a hugely important question. Um, and you could have a whole conference just on the, on the issues of intellectual property, of combating biopiracy, of indigenous data sovereignty. Um, and, and maybe that would be an important next step for this group to, to address those very issues. But I think one of the most important phrases that comes to mind in, in, this, in this realm is both data sovereignty and seed sovereignty. Um, and that is that, that the control of the knowledge and the stewardship of our plant relatives as seeds and in, in, in other forms should be honored and respected as the province of the, of the native peoples who have stewarded those those plants and that knowledge for, for all of this time. And there's a lot of important ways in which that's starting to be manifest through, um, I think about notable museums, for example, that are rematriating seeds from their museum collections um, back to the nations. Yeah. And, and to say that, this what what the museums say. You may have your germ plasm back. Like, <laughs> well, that's <laughs> well. At least it's coming back. <laughs> mm -hmm. We need to change that story and change that language. Um, but this 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 notion of housing um, responsibility um, for that knowledge with with the community. So seed sovereignty and data sovereignty are are really important. Mm. And, you know, to, to that end, I suspect that many in this community are involved in um, seed sharing and, uh, and, and, and plant sharing. And so to be really mindful of what are the appropriate protocols for, for sharing those plant relatives and to turn to our indigenous partners to be um, guiding that process. Mm. This is a question I like for several reasons, uh, and mainly because I had the great honor of visiting with Robin pre-pandemic, um, uh, having a chance to visit Syracuse and meet with an amazing group of students at her Center for Native Americans and the Environment. Really just a remarkable uh, opportunity I had, and I was so just felt so honored and gifted to have that opportunity to meet some of your own students and colleagues, Robin. Um, so this question from Anna about uh, what you see as some of the especially exciting and inspiring avenues of research in your realm that couple TEK and SEK to heal the human relationship with land. And again, I'm, when I read that question, I, I 
flashed on my mind being back with you in Syracuse and just remembering the rich conversations I had. But I, if I might tweak that question a little bit. Um, in your own institution or with so many that you get to interact with, Robin, are there some areas of research or practice that are in front of you right now, especially on this question of perennial agroecosystems mm -hmm. that you might be able to share? Yeah, um, one of the really exciting sort of umbrella concepts, I think, that knit together our shared interests here are this idea of, of what we're loosely calling a cultural provisioning network. We've we've grown so much by following the work of of, of leaders like Valerie Seacrest um, uh, in in this notion of how can we once again think about our landscapes as in this this correlation between biodiversity and food security um, and so we're really interested in it in, in how can we transform what are today here in the East Anyway called public lands, i.e. indigenous homelands that were taken over by the state, i.e. public lands. How could those public lands be managed and access to those public lands be managed in such a way to create a cultural provisioning network so that land is not either a a, a working forest or a recreation area or a preserve, but that the whole landscape is a cultural provisioning network where people can pick berries and 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 find nuts and medicines and 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 firewood to reconnect ourselves to the to the gifts of those lands and then have management so-called management tending protocols that 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 help to keep that uh, land healthy and vibrant through human agency of of all kinds of gardening, a kind mm -hmm. of gardening of the forest. Mm hmm. Mm. Yeah, I am going to take this question on. We only have time for a couple more. I'm well aware of that, and and uh, I will preemptively apologize to all the amazing comments and questions that have poured in uh, that we won't be able to get to, but um, amazing and difficult for me to try to summarize. Yeah. But Robin, this is one um, that's certainly on my mind a lot, and I know many others, about how we communicate with those who do have different lenses than we do. You talked in your talk about how can we use not only the two lenses that you showed in your graphic, but all the different ways we all experience in seeing the world. And we do this in very challenging times now internationally with so much pain and suffering in the world. Um, and we have seen how some of these issues that are in the news right now are really hurting not only those who are directly involved, but so many others. But I'll summarize a question that Joy asks at the very end. What have been your your most successful strategies in collaborating with those who hold firmly to a different lens and don't share the same values? It's a difficult question, but you are in uh, a position of interacting with so many people in so many institutions and landscapes and backgrounds. Um, perhaps you have a thought or two about strategies for working with those of different perspectives. Yeah, let me just make a note here so I don't lose this thought. Um, first of all, you know, your question really, if I could rephrase it in a very succinct way, would be how do we find common ground, right? Um, and I, I really value that framing it as how do we find common ground because it leads to the ground. Um, I think that is the common ground. Um, and I have found conversations with start, which start with love of the land um, to be a productive starting place. Um, how we manifest that love for the land and why we love the land um, is a doorway into conversation and relationship and into conflict. Um, because how how we practice that is 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 a, is a point of, of 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 
that is contested. Um, but if you begin with that common ground that we are all fed from the same bowl, I think the one bowl, one spoon teachings of both Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people, we're all fed from that same bowl. And so it is in all of our interests to keep it clean, um, to keep it productive. So starting there, it's really a matter also of, of starting with love. I'm thinking about a, 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 a agroecology scientist that I know of who was telling me that um, all of her data, all of her brilliant experiments um, have not been nearly as influential as in, in changing uh, farmland practices as a grandchild who says to their grandparents, I love the farm now because of what you did, because of those trees are there, because that savanna is there. Um, that It's that emotional relationship across generations with the land that can really be transformative. Mm -hmm. The other piece that I, I so much want to highlight because we've been talking about how to create this intellectual polyculture, right, is... And it's a difficult conversation, but to, to express to people who might not be following our thinking um, is that we have all been colonized. You know, there's this idea that, oh, that, that decolonization is the work of Native peoples. We have to um, recognize colonial structures, dismantle them, and re-engage re with Indigenous ways. All of those things are true, but everyone has been colonized by the Western worldview that says that productivity from the land, what we can take from the land is the most important value of land, that land is natural resources, that land is property and commodity. And we say, well, no, those are my deeply held values. Well, they might be, but recognize that those are imposed values um, from the Western worldview, that, that, that everybody's mind has been colonized. And in a sense, that diffuses a kind of anger about differences in values to say that we have a common experience. You know, which, what worldview, how do I really feel about the land? Not just what I was taught I ought to think about the land, but to be in touch with what you really feel about the land and to recognize the colonial philosophies that, that may have led you to a place where you're not happy. Mm -hmm. Robin, what a wonderful, poignant, challenging, difficult, inspiring moment. Uh, thank you so much. I hope I get to hug you in person again sometime soon. Um, please come and visit us yeah. if you have a chance in uh, in Wisconsin and Mawakanchuk. Uh, miigwech. Oh, thank you for those really thoughtful questions and and for the work that you're doing. It, it's, it's really inspiring to me to see people on the ground making these practices real. So, chi miigwech. And, and so good to be with you, Kurt. Thank you for um, bringing those, those questions and, and your own insights as well. That was Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer speaking at this year's Perennial Farm Gathering. I think a lot of us were pretty starstruck having Dr. Kimmerer there this year. I definitely was. It was a thrill and an honor to have her there, and I really don't know who we're going to get next year because they're going to have a tough act to follow. If you have something you'd like to hear on this podcast, or a question you'd like to ask, or a story you'd like to tell, please let me know. You can leave us a voicemail at 608-448-6432 or send us a message on social media at Savannah Institute and it'll find its way to me. Thanks for listening. If you want to get our newest episodes when they come out, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And if you're really feeling inspired and want to help us out, you can rate this podcast and write a review. It only takes a second and it really helps this podcast get heard by more people. And that's it for me. Until next time, keep up the good work, keep your feet on the ground, and keep an eye on the sky. <laughs>